All right, guys, we are T minus four weeks until we sail this boat across the Atlantic Ocean. Crossing an ocean has been a dream of ours for a long time now, like ever since we bought Atticus One. And now that we're getting really close to actually finally doing it, we've been talking to a lot of our friends and family about this big undertaking. And a lot of people have been really supportive and really excited, but a lot of people get really nervous and worried when we tell them about our plans. And they're often asking us how dangerous is what we're about to do. How dangerous is sailing across the Atlantic? And we started to realize that we actually don't quite have a good answer for that question. So this week we're going to continue to get the boat ready for our Atlantic crossing, including dialing in one of the most important systems on the boat, having a strong, reliable autopilot system. So let's go turn it on and see if it works. But we're also going to chat with our sailing hero, John Kretschmer, and ask him how dangerous is sailing across the Atlantic? I've been thinking about risk a lot lately because I think we tend to look at risk the wrong way. I'm Desiree and this is my husband, Jordan. We're sailing around the world, or at least trying to. We made it as far as Panama on our first boat, Atticus 1, which was a really small fixer upper. Now we're on our dream sailboat, Atticus 2, but she needs some work before she's ready to cross oceans. So we're working hard to finish up the last of our boat projects so we can set sail on our biggest adventure yet, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so today I've got a couple of relatively small projects that I'm hoping to bang out. The first of which is I'm gonna head down here into the engine compartment and back into the steerage where I discover that the hose clamps that secure and seal the rudder shaft stuffing box are really corroded and really need to be replaced. Now again here, I'm gonna use the really nice yet expensive ABA 316 stainless steel hose clamps. All right, so our next project is going to be finding a new way to secure this stay sail halyard. At the moment, it runs along the cabin top and back over to the cockpit. And it's really unnecessary back there because we never, ever, ever adjust it. And so it's just taking up space back there. It's taking up a clutch in the cockpit that I want to use for other stuff. So I'm going to be adding a clutch right here to the mast so that we can eliminate that run of the halyard into the cockpit. And then it'll just be able to cleat off with that clutch. The bolts that I was going to use to mount the clutch were too long. So I grabbed my handy vise and cordless grinder and cut them to length. Oh, gosh darn it, man. So I can't get the screw or the bolt to actually thread into the tapped hole that I've got on the mast. And I just went to double check the, the thread count on the bolt. The two 5 sixteenths taps that I have in that set were swapped. So I just tapped that hole with the wrong number of thread. So basically, I've got to re-drill that hole and re-tap it. And I'll just adjust the location of the hole a little bit so that that bad hole will be covered by the clutch. So we are getting super close to sailing this boat all the way across the Atlantic and I'm getting really excited but also a little bit nervous about having to learn a whole new language. So this week's video is brought to you by Babbel, a language learning app that can have you speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. So I've become kind of like the de facto language person aboard. Y para verificar, necesita mi tripulantes. Speaking Spanish really made our experience on Atticus 1 so much richer. Like when we met David in a super remote peninsula in Bocas del Toro, Panama. And we really wouldn't have been able to have such a deep experience if I hadn't spoke Spanish. Pero antes dijiste yes. Pero cambia de plan. Así cambia de plan. Porque pensé que era más pequeño. Ah, okay. <laughs> One thing I really like about Babbel is that you can download all of your lessons ahead of time, which means I can be learning Portuguese in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean without Wi-Fi. And ocean crossings can be monotonous, so I'm really excited about Babbel's super short 10-minute interactive lessons, which will help keep me mentally stimulated and awake while I'm on watch. I also really love how Babbel focuses on real-world practical conversations with 
with a focus on listening comprehension and pronunciation, Vanessa bumps into André at the mall. Oi, André, como vai? Oi, André, como vai? Hey, bud, como vai? Bien. <laughs> Estou bem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're interested in learning a new language, definitely check out Babbel. And if you click the link in the description below, you'll get 65% off of your subscription. Anyways, I'm going to get back to dominating Portuguese. Ciao. All right, so we've got our new autopilot bracket back, and this thing is beautiful. Mike from Pacific Seacraft, thank you very much, man. You are an artist. If you wanna know the difference between a good aluminum weld and a bad aluminum weld, look no further. This is all you gotta see. You can see with the old one, it's almost as if they installed the bracket for a different autopilot ram. And then when they switched to this one, they bolted on this plate here to shift the base of the autopilot a little bit further this way. So on the new one, what we did is we actually shifted the like extension of the bracket over this way relative to the mounting hole. The other thing that we did that I felt really needed to be done is we made the base plate that actually bolts onto the bulkhead much bigger. Because I mean, the length of this thing really makes it so that there's a lot of torque on that bit that's bolted to the bulkhead. Another thing is that the only real gusseting that this old bracket had was right here. So there's not a whole lot of like reinforcement going this way. So Mike welded up a couple of really nice gussets onto this piece. And then finally, this is the backing plate for the old bracket that was in the quarter berth. And you can see the new backing plate, much bigger, much more substantial. Now, another thing that we did to make sure that this whole system was gonna be bulletproof is we actually sent off the autopilot ram itself to a shop up in Rhode Island to have the thing totally rebuilt. And actually, you may remember a while ago that we heard like a popping noise. There was a leak occurring here at the bladder. There was some kind of diaphragm that was leaking. And so he was saying the theory is that air was getting into the hydraulic system and then the little valves, like when pressure builds up on one side, there's a valve that'll release that pressure to let the ram go the other way. And so it kind of made like a pop as the bubble pushed through. And so that's the theory right now. He was able to bench test it and really put it under a lot of load. He says it was working great. So I'm excited for a nearly brand new hydraulic autopilot ram for the Atlantic crossing. So right now I'm gonna dry fit the bracket in place and kind of mount the thing and just check all the measurements and make sure it's in the right spot. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is get the base of the autopilot ram exactly where I want it on the bracket. Got the bracket on, got the autopilot on, it's wired, it's ready to rock. So let's go turn it on and see if it works. All right, looks like it's working great. So mission accomplished. And I'm just so glad that we caught that, that we were able to deal with it in time because that is one system that I do want to be absolutely bulletproof for this Atlantic crossing. So this last week we had the opportunity to chat with professional sailor and author John Kretschmer, who is one of our favorite sailing authors. He's written a ton of books. My favorite is Sailing a Serious Ocean, which is actually all about sailing across and around the Atlantic Ocean. Now, a lot of the time when we're reading sailing literature, particularly when written by really impressive and accomplished sailors, it can feel a little intimidating reading their stories. But when I'm reading John Kretschmer, 
The cool thing about his writing style is he's such a humble guy, even though he's so accomplished and has sailed more blue water miles on more boats than like anybody I can think of. He's just still super down to earth and just like makes it feel like I can relate to him and what he's done and that maybe doing what he does is, is actually possible for somebody like me. First off, what advice would you give us regarding the Atlantic crossing? I think one of the critical mistakes people make with planning for the crossing is that they become very focused on sort of the A to B aspect of it. And they sometimes miss out on what is this incredibly cool thing about crossing the Atlantic. In terms of preparing the boat and pulling the crossing off, thinking, realizing that the days you're about to spend at sea are so incredibly powerful and magical and beautiful. And they're gonna seem that way so much to you guys because you've just been in such project mode for so long now. So when you push off to actually cross, try to push a lot of the preparation and project step away. Don't let perfect become the thief of good enough to make the crossing. And I, I just genuinely mean that because I see a lot of people view the crossing and it's only a success at the end. Mm. And I think that that's crazy because that kind of defines sailing by by the bookends of land when in fact you have such a cool boat you've got this story you're going to be able to tell and the story lies out there it's not just in checking off the box the reason you buy good boats is so that you can sail anywhere even if a lot of things happen electrical system doesn't work or some of the new stuff you put on doesn't work the basic core and the, the guts of your boat are so good that she's going to see it through you've got a boat that was just designed to cross the Atlantic. Sounds really good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we really needed to hear that. Yeah. Way. Once you start thinking about risk and things that can end poorly, it's a balance there that you can really go overboard with. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And speaking of risk, Jordan's nephew Christopher is going to be joining us for the crossing, and he just called us and was asking us how dangerous is this, and we found it kind of an interesting question to answer for someone who's never done an ocean crossing, who's never even maybe been on a sailboat. You know, it's funny because I've been thinking about risk a lot lately because I think we tend to look at risk the wrong way. The bigger risk for him might be in not doing it at all and losing this opportunity. I think the thing about ocean sailing that is profoundly true is that it's not particularly dangerous, but it can be really uncomfortable. I mean, it's possible you guys can run into a big gale. It's unlikely. You know, crossing the Atlantic at the right time of year, you can really minimize that risk, but you can't eliminate it. But for him, I think getting his mind wrapped around the fact that it might not be beautiful until day four, <laughs> and he might just be questioning himself, like, why the hell did I ever sign on with these people? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's a bigger, bigger question. The main danger, and it's, it was another one of the questions you sent me, are falling off the boat. That's the big danger, more than storms, more than anything else. What do you think is like the most important elements of preventing man overboard situations and dealing with them if they happen? Here's the deal. When you have kids, you don't tell your kids, look, honey, after the bus hits you, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> I think that you have to emphasize that it's not okay to fall off the boat. Man overboard is not a technique. It's not a strategy that you practice. Man overboard is a disaster. It's an emergency. It's a 911. The real way you stay safe is you stay upwind of the loaded fittings. You don't position yourself so that if a sheet slips, it whacks you and knocks you overboard. And do you ever do like man overboard drills, like in a calm-ish area? Well, yeah, we do them with people off the boat. And it's pretty amazing when somebody, we practice having people fall off the boat tethered up. And the reality is at three to four knots, it becomes virtually impossible to be dragged along the boat without drowning and really, really hard to pull someone up. Mm -hmm. We've done it with world-class athletes. We did it just in March with, with a world-famous mountain climber. And pulling him at four knots, he realized if he didn't release, he was going to drown. So, yeah, nobody wants to hear this news <laughs> because you want to just clink that tether on and think you're safe and think Jordan's just going to reach over and yank you up. That might happen, but you reaching over and yanking Jordan up is unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, and Jordan's survival is going to count on him quick releasing from his tether, you doing an instant heave too floating back to him and tossing him a line or whatever to get him back on the boat. I think having a really good inflatable harness 
and having a really short tether and trying to organize your jack lines so that they're down the center of the boat. It's really hard to do. So if you really enjoyed this chat with John Kretschmer, he's doing a webinar series on sailing across the Atlantic specifically. You can sign up by sending an email to jrkretschmer at gmail.com. And finally, John Kretschmer is having a monthly captain's hour where if you sign up, you can join a Zoom meeting with other sailors and you get the opportunity to just pick John's brain and try to learn as much as you can. So again, if you're interested in that, you can sign up by emailing jrkretschmer at gmail.com. So we had a super informative conversation with John Kretschmer. We dove into a lot of the details and nitty gritty stuff about sailing across the Atlantic. But probably the biggest takeaway for me from our conversation with him was this concept that sure sailing across the Atlantic is risky, but so is not sailing across the Atlantic. And it's really helping me to formulate my approach and my outlook on what it is that we're about to do, right? We are taking on risk. There is a certain level of danger involved in it. And we're working really hard with all of these projects, with all the stuff on our to-do list. Doing all those projects are going to bring our risk level down. But I think that at the end of the day, we need to keep in mind the risk of not pursuing our dreams and of not pursuing things that we find to be meaningful. So we hope you stick with us for the next couple weeks while we continue to get the boat ready, continue to bring our risk level down and get ready for this huge and exciting challenge. We'll catch you guys next week. Hey guys, thanks so much for checking out this week's episode. Also, if you enjoyed that interview with John Kretschmer, we are going to be releasing the full interview to our patrons. So if you're not a patron yet, this is a great time to consider hopping on board, and you can do that by hopping over to patreon.com slash projectatticus. Also, I have been doing a ton of research about what to pack in our emergency ditch bag and what kind of additional safety gear and equipment we'd like to have on our Atlantic crossing. And a lot of our friends and family have been asking us how they can pitch in to help Help keep us safe during this big adventure coming up. So we figured we'd let you know that we made an Atlantic Crossing Amazon wish list, which I will link to in the description below. And it's got everything that we're looking to purchase before we take off over the horizon. So if you'd like to help us out with some of our safety gear, it would be a huge help and we'd be so grateful. Finally, I wanted to thank our patrons for sticking with us through this long year of boat projects and getting Atticus 2 ready for this big adventure. We are so excited for what's beyond the horizon and what's next, and we wouldn't be able to take this huge step without you guys. So thank you so much for your love, encouragement, and support. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to thank some of our newest patrons. Starting off with our newest bosun level patrons, thank you so much, Paul J. Arden and Danny Acosta. Moving on to our newest Yachtmaster level patrons, thank you so much, Molly and Mitch Owens. And finally, to our newest deckhand level patrons, a big thank you to Tanner Dendy, Travis Little, it has been such a pleasure getting to know you here in Washington. Wade and Crystal Whiteside, Matthew Moore, Jean Schmall, Don Strong, Don Very Strong, Desiree Strong, Phil and Michelle Mavis, Nurse Tom, Brian Angela, John D. Riley, Christopher Coyle, Todd Snedeker, Eric Jensen, and Alice Ward. Thank you again so much. I hope you have an amazing weekend and we'll see you next week.